hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to the second lecture in the MSCDP Conversations of Practitioners lecture series. For those of us joining for the first time, Computational Design Practices is an MS program in its second year that introduces students to a range of possibilities for design work at the intersection of architecture, urbanism, and computation. My name is Adam Vosberg. I am the Assistant Director of Computational Design Practices, along with Laura Kurgan, who is the Director of the program. This lecture series is designed to introduce students to, pra to, pra to practitioners who are working with computation on various media and subject matters at a wide variety of scales. Last week, we welcomed Curry Hackett, who spoke about his work in placemaking and recent experiments with generative AI, all of which was kind of oriented more or less at the scale of the individual. Today's speaker, on the other hand, has typically worked in much larger scales, those of cities and urban systems defined broadly. Defined broadly. It is in that context in which I introduce Siki Zhu, a new York City-based urbanist technologist whose work bridges urban development, strategic design, and urban technologies. Siki's professional work underpins his critical interests, how urban technologies and real estate development shape and are in turn shaped by the political economic regime of the contemporary city, the legibility and governance of emerging cyber physical technology being deployed in urban space, technology controversies and technology counterfactuals, and evolving demands on, his, on the design professions to respond to these issues effectively. He was formerly Director of Planning and Delivery for Sidewalk Labs, where his work imagined how technology transforms the design and implementation of urban streets and public realms. Before Sidewalk, Siki had a product design and envelope, a New York City-based startup that visualizes development opportunities under New York City zoning. I don't know fully what he's doing these days, but as I understand it, he is back working at Saki Associates, and he can tell us a little bit more of that, that in the lecture. Siki also teaches at Harvard's Master of Design Engineering program, where he works with students to design and prototype speculative technologies for societal good. He holds a bachelor's degree in engineering science from the University of Toronto and a master's in urban planning from Harvard University GSD, and has led research projects at MIT Sensible City Lab. We'll have a brief Q&A afterwards, so make sure to take the opportunity to ask some questions or share thoughts about Siki's work. Thanks again for coming, everyone, and join me in welcoming Siki Zhu. Thank you so much. Um, can, can folks hear me clearly? Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I was here in this program last year for reviews, and I think I overlapped with some of you, and I was really impressed by the work and thought the conversations were really good. So I'm happy to be back here and continue some of the conversations we're having. Um, so um, like Adam said, um, I'm currently a partner and director of a nascent urban technologies um, design practice within a firm called Sasaki, which is a global planning landscape architecture architecture firm uh, based in Boston, now with an office in New York. Um, I can talk more about that, um, but I think what I'd love to do today is to, um, you know, follow the spirit of this lecture series and talk a little bit about my practice, my, the history of my practice more generally, um, and also talk about like what motivates me and why it's interesting and why that might, might be relevant to you. Um, I think it's really interesting, you know, just given my interest in, like many of you, the intersection between urban urbanism, the built environment, and technology, um, given that I'm at GSAP and CDP in particular, which is, you know, really at the productive intersection between urbanism and technology. I think the question that's really uh, interesting to me and hopefully we can talk about later is um, just what exactly is the role of the designer in shaping the uh, directionality of technology and technology change in our cities, right? Um, if you believe uh, the discourse, which is, you know, technology has dramatically shifted our cities and will continue to do so, which, you know, I believe for the most part, um, what is our role within that, and what is the opportunity space for us as designers and graduates of this program. So I think that's the underpinning of what I'll be talking about today. Um, to give a, a kind of brief uh, background of my history, my professional history, so I have to say I'm, I'm a bit of an imposter in the school because I'm actually not an architect. Um, I train as an urban planner. Um, uh, with an engineering background, but uh, weirdly in school over 10 years ago now at this point, um, I became really interested in the use of visual information um, to communicate complex issues of urban design and urban policy. And that maybe was my entryway drug into this uh, intersection of urbanism and technology. So 
Luckily, um, one of the first projects I got coming out of grad school was working with the city of Boston to develop a set of guidelines for their emerging Complete Streets program, which at the time was new for Boston, certainly new for Boston, and you know, new for the North American context. So my, my job was developing a set of a visual system, a set of visual material that communicates all of the complex issues that underpin what makes a complete street, who operates it, who makes it possible, what does it look like, and how does it function. So these are some examples of the work that came out of that, that job. Um, and it, as you can see, it really spans a, a, a huge range of scales uh, from the level of the design of individual tree pits to the larger, more zoomed out questions of you know, what makes for a complete and smart intersection of urban streetscape and what are the design and operational and technolo technological elements of that. So this is my, um, you know, my sort of uh, the start of this whole story. Um, and then luckily, you know, with the same client, um, a few years later, I undertook the um, citywide transportation planning effort, Go Boston 2030, a huge part of which was actually um, data visualization, data design, specifically with the idea that through data visualization and, visual and design, we can pinpoint and untangle truly the most critical issues facing Boston's mobility in the years to come. And that, unsurprisingly, is the intersection between transportation planning and equity and how, you know, like most actually deeply segregated North Amer Northeastern American cities, um, where and how you get to move around is to a great extent determined by your socioeconomic and racial um, status in the city. So um, these are some of the work I did, uh, you know, with, with a very enlightened public official, actually. You know, they were very, uh, or he, I should say, was very um, encouraging and open to me working <clears throat> with data as a medium to really tell pretty complex stories about how people commute how they move around, and how unequal that situation is actually across the city. So I looked at issues around um, how people commute. Um, I looked at walkability as a luxury asset in a city like New York. So one of the things we looked at in particular was, um, you know, where, how walkable you, your neighborhood is and to what extent you walk to work, to shop, to leisure is largely a product of um, your economic standing, socioeconomic standing in the city. So these are some examples. Um, and then finally, um, I also worked at MIT uh, for a year working on some of their emerging urban big data initiatives. One of the longest running ones, a uh, very prominent one, was working with the government of Singapore where the government of Singapore being the kind of government it is, has a lot of data readily available about how people travel through the city, uh, how people use the telecommunication networks, how these systems and dynamics intersect with natural phenomena like weather patterns, uh, rain events, and so on and so forth. And this is some of the outcome of that work. And one of the things I, I worked on, and this also influenced my later work is to think about how we can take these large urban data sets and make them perhaps a point of discussion and um, a nucleus of consensus among the many citizens of Singapore. You know, these, this is really the first time uh, most people in the city, average people in the city, have seen any of these data sets and how their city works. So, the design brief that I worked on was how do you turn this data set inside out and how do you make it a, a sort of um, a, a, a thing in front of which people can discuss, you know, how does the city work and how might we change it? So this resulted in um, a number of design prototypes, um, including museum exhibits, um, interactive exhibitions. So this thing you looked at was sort of a giant data interface that we designed and implemented and put in the museum, in the National Museum of Singapore. And you, you can sort of imagine people making composite data visualizations 
um, using this interface and kind of curating their own stories. And, and that was the aspiration anyway. In reality, you know, um, it was a little complicated, but we can talk about that. Um, so these kind of things I worked on on and off for seven to eight years. Um, you know, I, I would broadly call this um, what I, in my mind, I call it the sort of technology of urban social epistemology. And the idea here really is this is a set of technologies with which people make sense of how their cities work, they understand the key issues facing their cities, and they can collectively construct and perhaps form some sort of common understanding and perhaps even consensus about how the city should work. Um, so this is one broad bucket of my work. Um, and I should also point out that um, I, I've never seen this kind of work, this kind of technology work as being fundamentally separate from planning. They're extremely intertwined in my mind. So for example, the work I did in Boston around the Mobility Plan 2030 was to make those visualizations but put them in the context of a public forum. So the whole purpose of creating those visualizations helping people understand the relationship between walkability and socioeconomics is to put those questions in front of people and elicit reaction, solicit reactions and um, um, maybe even you know, surface some disagreements about how the city should be, right? So I'll just say, um, to me, it's never been a kind of static, beautiful object. It's always been there to do something and have performed some kind of political um, effect. And this is um, something that's quite important to me and I'd love to talk about that later. Um, yeah, some other examples, you know, these, this sort of data practice has always been a core part of many different kinds of planning projects I worked on. So I work a lot with cities and municipalities and I still do. And this kind of making sense of the city through data and design visualization has always been a core part of it. And this is just another example of that. Um, like many of you, uh, I'm also interested in technologies of design process. Um, I've worked on a couple of these products, some of which you might know. Um, one of those uh, from, actually this is now defunct. Um, I worked on this five years ago. Uh, the product is called Amalope. It's a digital product. And the idea is for New York City in particular, Every development site is subject to many, many, many constraining factors that determines what, in the end, the development might look like. So you probably know about FARs, you know about law coverage, maximum height, and through the complex interaction of these rules, you get a building that's shaped a certain way. So the contention of this software is that it's really hard to do this, and it's, uh, there's a lot of professional gatekeepers that benefit from the zoning code being so hard to interpret. And um, the, uh, the founder of this startup, actually, who used to be at GSAP, Sarah Williams, um, her idea was let's encode those zoning rules as algorithmic rules and develop a software that parses all the rules and also visualizes the outcome. So the idea eventually became a piece of software that, you know, you can kind of imagine how it works. You pick a site, you click on, uh, you, gen you provide a few small in number of inputs, and the software essentially, through those zoning rules, generates the final outcome for you. Um, kind of complicated because, uh, you know, one of the reasons it failed is because it was hard to imagine how to make money with the software and who's actually paying for it. Um, uh, you know, we thought about uh, architects buying this because this is a lot of what architects do. Uh, they do this, as a matter of fact, they do this oftentimes for free for their developer clients because this is a way of getting in their good favors and be on the ground floor, literally and metaphorically, of a potential new architecture and design project. So it was really hard to extract additional economic value from what is already a um, essentially economically challenging situation, right? So if you are already doing this for free, would you pay additional money to this software to do it for you? 
Um, again, you know, we come back to this entanglement between technology and economics, which, you know, in some small way was very influential for me in, in thinking about, you know, just how we should work in the sphere. Um, I want to sh quickly show, oh, okay, well, of course, something doesn't work. Um, the, the, other, uh, the other product I worked on, and this is something that Violet, uh, a, another faculty here in this program, and I worked on together, is a software called Delve. Um, and this is maybe, the idea of this is perhaps familiar to you. Um, it is a computational design software that generates, automatically generates a large number of urban design options based on some small number of inputs you provide. You draw a site, you specify the high level parameters of what you want. I want 50% resi, 25% commercial, and I want it to be, you know, um, I want it to have this amount of open space, and voila, you put in these inputs, and this goes in the machine, essentially generates 50 options, 100 options, 200 options, which then allows you to pick, you know, what is the best one. Um, so I worked on this, actually I only worked on this for one year, this was a much longer ongoing pro project before I even started in it. Um, but um, you can, I think, I think for all of us it's easy to see both the promise and hopefully what the problem might be with a, with a project like this, right? Um, the pro the, one of the problems, just to go back to what I was saying before, is again the question of economics, right? Who is paying for this and who is really extracting value from the deployment of this technology? Where in the design and development process is this solution in fact valuable? So this is, um, you know, yet again, like there are certain questions that you can't escape from, right? When you're working on developing technologies and using technologies. And lastly, um, I want to talk about a third kind of technology work I've been doing, uh, or I have done, have, is doing right now, which is what I call the technology of digital physical governance. Um, uh, Adam didn't mention this um, before, uh, just a couple years ago, I was working at uh, Sidewalk Labs, which was, um, as some of you might know, a, the urban innovation uh, startup within Alphabet. Uh, funded by Google, but separate from it, um, that broadly was looking at how to um, develop cities differently, right? So one of the projects I worked on, and one of the key projects I worked on really, is a ambitious um, flagship demonstration project, urban development project in Toronto. Um, so if you look up Keyside on Google, you can probably find a thousand hits of, you know, think pieces, pro, con, a lot of con, um, that talks about what this project is. Fundamentally, this is a real estate development project, right? This is like anything you see walking down the streets of New York. This is a project that is, you know, converting financial capital into physical capital. It's a design project. It's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's an experimental technology project um, in the sense that within these buildings, you have a lot of new systems that we were hoping to bring into the world. So one of those examples you're looking at is uh, revolutionizing urban logistics. You know, instead of Amazon driving up to your door, dropping things off at your doorstep, and then getting packages stolen, this is a different way of organizing and rationalizing urban logistics such that it takes up less space, it's easier, it's more sustainable, efficient, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, it's all of those things, um, but, I, but I argue that um, this is also a sort of governance project, a project of thinking about a different way of governing cities in which instead of the complex and messy logic of individuals doing different things, we abstract all of that away into data and algorithms, right? So if you look at a diagram like this, it's all extremely kind of smooth running, everything moving silently, governed by um, the underlying infrastructure of data and technology and sensors. And I would say this is kind of the fundamental underpinning of this project. And um, and my job actually, interestingly, was to think about how 
these systems uh, actually can come to life. Because as you can imagine, to get all of these things to work, it depends on the orchestration of many, many different pieces, both physical and digital. Everything has to work together. And as a matter of fact, none of these things have previously worked in the world. So part of the work and part of the big risk is proofing it, right? Making sure that this thing actually have a, any kind of chance of working in the real world. So that was a big part of my work. And, um, uh, you know, for example, taking ideas of modular technology embedding sensors into some version of a real world prototype. That was kind of the kind of work I did. And, you know, what to me illustrates this logic of uh, data-driven gover data governance of cities is the idea of managing urban curbside spaces, right? This idea that instead of static parking signs and parking meters, we have a system that tells people this is exactly what you can use the curbside space for during what time, and this is how much you pay for it. So this was actually a project I spent a lot of time working on, uh, developing a system to experiment and test this idea of managing the curbside flexibly. Um, I think this is a maybe interesting test case to think about how a designer within this room might fit into work like this, um, because it truly cuts across a whole spectrum of design capabilities from the digital to the physical, right? You first have to imagine thinking like a UX designer, a service designer, what the experience of this space actually is, what does it become throughout the time of the day, whether it's for loading, you know, public realm, trucks, uh, pick up, drop off. You have to think about the experience of that. Um, you have to think about all of the different sort of technical affordances of the system, right? These are all the things that it can do. And you have to think about how it all comes together as a physical object and a physical space, right? We come back to the space of architecture. And then you also need to know what are the individual kinds of enabling technologies that makes all of these things possible and work together. So you need to be a engineer, a technologist, uh, someone who can understand how these individual components work, but then also put them together in the context of a system that talks to each other, you know, sensor A talking to sensor B, actuating, you know, um, element C, so on and so forth. Um, and even a bit of software development. So one of my jobs is actually thinking about what the back end of the system needs to look like, who needs to monitor this, and make what decisions. And all of this comes together in the context of a pilot, uh, which I put together in Brooklyn Navy Yard, which only wrapped up last year. So this, all of this, um, as simple as it looks, took way longer than you think, what, than you think it did. Um, so I think this is a good example of, again, what I call the technology of digital physical governance. But what was really interesting to me also is we think technologies like this eliminate difficult questions about how to run cities. But in fact, what it actually does is it displaces one set of questions and raises other kinds of questions, right? To make it, to put it most prosaically, um, we built this prototype and we really had to think who the hell is going to run this thing in the 12 month in which no one's going to be around this, this thing? What, what if something goes wrong? Who fixes it? And I guess most importantly, who's actually setting the rules in terms of who gets to use the curb during what time for what purposes, right? So technologies like this actually, again, instead of eliminating and abstracting away a lot of the questions of urban governance simply produces new questions. And these questions maybe in a way is a bit more hidden and um, less talked about. And for me, that was maybe the biggest sort of central insight of my work in the last few years is who thinks about these questions and where does one work if one wants to help think about those questions, right? So. So yeah, so, so that brings me to, I guess, you know, just some, maybe some observations about, um, about the contemporary moment, the, inter the intersection between technology and urbanism, and, you know, what, what, we, sh what we should be thinking about today. Um, I think 
what something like the flexible curve tells us is technologies like that, they have very explicit functions and uses, right? I'm building this thing to manage urban curbside spaces, to make them more efficient, more sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. But they also perform a more implicit set of political economic agendas, right? And um, these agenda, just to give an example of that, um, you know, when we go back to everything I did around data visualization, urban data, these technologies are not really just about visualizing data and making them beautiful and understandable, presentable, right? We create these technologies with an explicit purpose of forming opinions, forming consensus, making sure that people understand urban issues in a way that we want them to understand, understand those issues. And I would say these technologies is a way of creating a kind of common sense, right, around how cities should be. Um, this kind of common sense can be democratic in the case of, you know, us using data visualization to talk to the citizens of Boston, talk about the futures of the city. It can obviously also be very technocratic and even autocratic, right? I, I you know, I, I just, I can't help it, you know, I bring up an image of the, the smart city uh, control center in Rio, which is the case that everybody shits on as what smart cities shouldn't be. But I think it illustrates my point, right? You can use data to illuminate how the city works, but that knowledge can serve very different purposes, right? Um, I think this also um, illustrates a second important point, which I really want to hit home, which is the political value valence of these technologies isn't fixed, right? You can take almost the same technology, put it in two different contexts, and they can perform radically different political functions and economic functions, right? Um, to give one example, back to the curbs, curbside spaces again, right? If you look at a technology that many people were looking at a few years ago, which is codifying every single inch of urban curbside spaces, having that information as a way to put a price on it. You can argue that it is about making urban streets more efficient, but you can also argue that it's about monetizing what is otherwise just a public asset, right? And these two outcomes are entirely possible, and I argue that there is space and in fact a sort of obligation for us to think about what 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 is that future outcome that we want and want to shape um i i want to just show, show some other examples and maybe get us all to think about kind of what an alternative arrangement of this technology might be right so from curbside spaces to using curbs as the loading zones for uh, urban logistics companies networks um you know uh, we kind of walk by this every day, we kind of take it for granted now, but it's not a sort of, it's not a given, right? It's, this is the way, the, the, the way that delivery companies use urban curbside public assets as a way to unload, as a place to unload their, their goods is not a natural state of affairs. This is highly contingent. This happened for a whole set of reasons and things happening and things not happening, right? Um, I talked to Laura about this briefly a few months ago, um, this idea that we have a technology infrastructure to, uh, for gig work, for getting food delivered, getting laundry delivered, and um, you know, getting your needs taken care of, getting someone to come and fix your door. But it's the same technology infrastructure with which you can imagine a different way of organizing uh, municipal services and the municipal mutual aid. And I don't think these two technology infrastructures are that different, but I think it just illustrates the point that with the same technology in two different societal economic contexts, they can do very different things. I wanna pose these oppositions in terms of what those different things might look like. Um, you know, when we talk about urban spaces and urban streets and curbside spaces, are we creating common spaces? Are we creating commons, or are we creating a market out of those spaces, right? Um, what kind of relationship do we put people in relation to each other? You know, are we creating relationships of mutuality or relationships of exchange, right? And are we, at the end of the day, 
creating public value or private value. Um, kind of complicated, but actually it's really simple. I think it's an argument that people have been making for a very long time, which is any kind of technology encodes a certain set of social relations and social assumptions and political assumptions, and these technologies in turn affect those relations, right? So looking forward to some of the incoming technological transformations of the city, just to take EV charging, for example, right? We take EVs as an un, un, uncomplicated good, right? It's a good thing. We're turning fossil fuel burning cars into, EV, into electric cars. But this technology infrastructure also embeds a lot of values in what it does and what it doesn't do. And one of the things it does do right now is it excludes people. It doesn't include a lot of people in this infrastructure deployment. And when you look at how they're actually built in the street, even at the level of design, minute design, at the level of individual streetscapes, you also see choices between what is important and what isn't important. And, um, you know, like for example, this is uh, LA a couple of years ago, just EV charging cables across um, across bike lanes. I mean, I, I could, I, you know, you can argue that this is, there's maybe a, just a much more innocent mistake here, but in a way, like, no mistakes are innocent. <laughs> like, you know, like, every, 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 every innocent mistake has something better assumptions behind it that I think is worth interrogating. So these are the questions that really motivate me. And, uh, you know, if I pose it back to designers in this room and designers like myself, you know, broadly speaking, what technologies get made and how, right? Um, importantly, how are these technologies deployed, operated, and managed, right? Who makes these decisions? And then ultimately, um, to what end and for whose benefit? Um, you know, and, and I think it's maybe worth making a small digression here about generative AI. I think a lot of the conversations today um, opposes, uh, you know, artificial intelligence against humanity, which is sort of a very kind of romantic humanist way of looking at technology. But there are much more mundane questions you can ask about generative AI, which is like, who is making these things for what purposes and what kind of relationships do generative AI creates between people? And is that a, you know, equitable good relationship that we want to perpetuate? So anyway, raising these questions, but then, you know, the big question for us, which is, you know, what are, our, what are our vectors of influence in these questions? Because a lot of those questions are frankly decided outside of the sphere of technology and design per se, right? We don't really, we're not really in the room uh, deciding on these things, right? Um, uh, venture capital does <laughs> to, to a great extent, you know, in terms of what technologies get made and how. So, um, so this brings me back to uh, what I'm doing now. Um, I actually started my job only three months ago, but there was a much longer incubation period behind that. Um, I thought it was very important for me to get back into planning, but also still work on technology questions, but work on these technology questions in particular, questions of um, you know, how to deploy, how to operate, how to manage, you know, how to turn these into a sort of political conversation. So, um, so the practice I'm running right now is, um, you know, what I call this urban design, urban technology design practice. And broadly speaking, uh, you know, the mission statement is helping to shape purposeful value add technology applications in cities, aligning um, technology applications with purpose, with public value, and really think about the questions of deployment, operation management, which is where a lot of those values actually get reflected and come in. Um, to give just a super short rundown of what I'm doing right now to kind of make those things reality, I would say broadly speaking, it's kind of three buckets of work, making, shaping, and critiquing. Um, I think it's important for all of us to still be making technologies, right? To, because we're interested in it, because it's interesting, it's fun, and, um, but I think what I've been trying to be very conscious about is making technologies to what end and giving, it, giving that technology to whom and what do they do with it and what kind of outcome is that producing. So um, to give one example, uh, one, of, one of the projects I started since I joined is um, 
working with the chief heat officer of LA. So it's a new position that was created in the city that deals specifically with climate change and extreme heat in the city. So my work is working with her to develop a set of technology solutions that specifically helps her address the challenges of her work. And those challenges are actually really mundane. It goes back to a lot of the things we talked about earlier, right? It is data geospatial analysis, data visualization, overlaying um, remote sensing of, you know, uh, urban heat island with socioeconomic indicators that indicates extreme stress, right? So that's one vector of work. And the other vector is honestly even simpler, which is that she is one bureaucrat within a larger city and her influence on other city departments to do what she needs them to do is limited by her ability to communicate and coordinate and organize. So we're really just looking at creating technologies for her where she can say, well, I need this done by the Department of Transportation, which I don't have formal influence over, but this is a technology that can help us coordinate efforts better. So one example. Um, in terms of shaping technologies, um, I want to just give two examples of things that I've seen out there as potential examples. I haven't, I, this is something I'm honestly trying to think about what it looks like, because if you're shaping technologies, you have to think about, you know, what, with what power you're shaping them, right? Um, today, the, the, the most important power shaping technology development, in this country anyway, is a private investment system of which venture capital is at, at its very heart, right? Venture capital decides what we collectively, as a society, invest in technology development, A versus B, right? Um, what I'm interested in is, is there some kind of public power that allows us to shape the directionality of those technologies, if not how to make them, then at least how they're being deployed and used in the real world. So um, I think that work is beginning to happen. Um, one of the things I looked at in building the business case for my work is work such as the one on the right, uh, the LA lighting plan. So this is a city department that's literally working with communities to decide if our city has a capital budget to buy new technologies, buy light poles that can do X, Y, Z, what exactly do we want to buy and for what purpose, right? So this is not even so much in the realm of making like technology as we commonly think of it, but is firmly in the realm of planning. And that's why um, I think doing this work in planning with, in a planning context is really important. Um, I, talk, I want to talk a little bit about the fun stuff I do, which is the critiquing part of it. Um, I don't do this as a professional practice, but um, my partner, who's an artist, and I have been developing a set of um, projects, I would say, around technology counterfactuals, which is this idea that let's construct a alternative history of how some technology might have developed, and let's just play that out, and let's just see what the outcome of that um, counterfactual of that different history might have been. And the purpose of it is not necessarily to uh, bemoan the present um, as much as it is to understand what is malleable and contingent about our present moment and what can actually change, right? Because the moment you start thinking about alternative histories, you realize nothing was supposed to have, nothing was predetermined about the way things developed and things can still change, right? So one of the ones we worked on was um, uh, a different history of the internet, right? So many people have written histories of internet um, and what we did was um, just, you know, just played out. Like what if, what if um, the internet evolved in a different way? Um, what if it remained the sort of academic communication network that it was intended, uh, that, it, that it initially developed as? and what are the sort of societal, economic, and political outcomes of that. Um, so this is more just a fun exercise to kind of keep my brain engaged, um, but um, something that we're hoping to develop further. So uh, that's it for my presentation. I, I do wanna just spend the last couple of minutes zooming out um, about like thinking about our present moment and why it might be interesting for us to think about this kind of work. 
Um, I think, you know, a couple of things I'll observe. Um, technologies have gotten much more sophisticated, much more complicated, but also much simpler in a way, right? There are, as you all of you who have played with ChatGPT in the last few months know, um, there is a way in which those technologies are actually much very friendly to beginners and novices, right? The barrier to entry of testing new ideas and making new ideas actually in a weird way is lower, lower now than it, you know, for a much longer time previously. So, so I think there might be more creativity coming in to this space. And the other big driver is um, a different larger political context in which you know, the federal government's actually making industrial policy again. It's doling out like billions and billions and billions of dollars into local governments to combat climate change, grow green economies, and so on and so forth. And what that translates into is greater public power and greater public power through which we can affect many of the changes that, you know, I've been thinking about. So, you know, I want to end on a sort of optimistic note. I think like, this work obviously is very challenging, but at the same time, I think it's happening at a funny and interesting and kind of exciting moment. And um, so yeah, so that's what I want to leave you with. And uh, I know I talked a lot, a lot of, about a lot of things. Um, we can you know, continue this conversation during the Q&A. So thank you. Sweet. Thanks so much, Suki. That was great, and it's like, in, in some ways, your career, we mentioned, I, talk, we talk, I talked with you about this before, but it's in some way your career has followed so many things going on in urban tech mm -hmm. in a way that you are like uniquely kind of positioned as an interesting person to talk about this. Um, I'm sure all of y'all have questions. Um, same as last time, I have a couple of mics that I can dole out, so please just raise a hand if you have a question and I'll come over and give you one. Hi, thank you for this uh, great lecture. Uh, I'm not from the CDB program, I'm from AAD, and it's actually pretty funny that I attend this lecture today because we're. I just read Bruno Latour before coming into this. You, uh, uh, Bruno Latour. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was just reading about exactly how um, technologies are not political but they do create um, social interactions or they organize social interactions based on who governs technologies in a way. And that's something you talked about a lot. Um, on this age where like, we're all interconnected through um, internet and all these kinds of things, what do you say is our responsibility towards creating technology which can be um, actively relocated globally on different places, different contexts? because the politics of the technology changes depending on which context it is. So would you say our role is to make technology um, infinitely abusable and perhaps open source? Oh, that's, just, wow, that's a great question, but kind of hard to answer. But you might have to repeat the second part of your question a little bit, because I don't think I like totally caught it. Um, maybe just break it down a little bit for me. Uh, I mean, yeah. I guess I'm just saying, um, since technologies are abusable and abusable. changeable, right? Yeah. Um, uh, is it our role to make, allow them to be abusable so that they're not politically streamlined to just... Well, I guess I would put the question back to you, like what does it look like to make these technologies of communication abusable in your word? Um, maybe just to clarify that a little bit and we can kind of riff, riff on that. Yeah, what does that look like to you? Well, I would hope, uh, so something that your project did, um, there was a technology, I would say New York City laws to our technology that shape how buildings become. Yeah. And your project was in a way anti-technology or technology against that technology, right? Yeah, um, like the zoning code is a sort of social technology, like the 1961 zoning code is, right? And our technology is sort of a way of taking the fangs out of that right. kind but of indecipherable text, yeah. If it is employed by someone else, it is still abusable, right? Hmm. So how do you liberate technology from being um, 
used as a weapon for tyranny? Uh, tyranny? Do you oh, um, wow. Uh, yeah. Great question. Um, I think there is a more, I think there is a more pessimist school here, which is to say that in a way, like we get exactly the technologies we deserve. Like, you know, a certain capitalist order produce, is, is destined to produce certain technologies of oppression. And those technologies like it's, are re irredeemably going to be harmful and do all these terrible things that like the larger system conditions to do. I don't, I'm not so sure if I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic actually, because I don't think um, there's always, I mean, if you, you know, if you read more, like a lot more of these, um, the sort of like social construction, this side of technology, uh, science technology studies, they'll argue that like, especially in early days of any technology, the meaning, the valence, the value, the use of that technology is very much open to shaping and debate. And, um, and I think that's true. Like, I think, um, you know, you look at something like the early internet, for example, like it does, it still does perform like what I would say is like a very liberatory function, right? Um, so I don't know, I, I guess I'm trying to say that I, I'm not so like deterministic in terms of like technology is gonna do this because we live in a certain society and it's destined to do that. Like I don't think I believe that. I think there is a role to shape it and that's why I even do what I do in the first place at all. But I think you ask a more important question is how do we actually do that? Um, how do we shape the valence and effect of technologies as they're deployed in the real world? And I think, I don't know, I mean, I can't give you a generic like blanket answer, do this and everything will be great. I don't know. I do think, I do think um, public power is an important ingredient. I think having like a certain FTC person in the federal government who regulates these technologies that's sympathetic, that makes a huge difference. I think, um, I do think organizing makes a, makes, makes a, makes a difference um, depending on the context. Um, I do think designers like us have a, have a, have a role, um, but it's not so much us designing in a vacuum like, it's not just about us sitting in our bedrooms speculating what a different technology future might look like. We really have to be thoughtful about what kind of power we leverage to achieve that outcome, whether that's some kind of public power or organizing power or something else. I don't know, I hope that answered the question partly, but it's kind of a, it's a big question and hard to answer. <laughs> Hi, um, that was really, really fascinating, so thank you. Um, I have a question for, that's very specific to someone who's interested in mm -hmm. kind of this field, whether you call it urban technology, strategic mm -hmm. design. Um, so I'm from South Africa, and uh, this is something I've been really fascinated uh, with for a long time, and I work more on like economic commons and, and that sort of thing. But I've often found that um, conversations around urban technology seem to be very centered in places where there is some kind of tradition or culture around urban design, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that you get to work with these partners and do some really, really cool projects. I'm sitting here thinking like, how on earth do I do that in a place like Kilifi in Kenya where there's no chief of oh, heat. Um, if you no. want to speak to anyone no, no, in a bureaucratic no. No. position, you probably yeah. have to bribe them. So it's like, what is your advice for practicing this in a way that is meaningful? Do you have examples perhaps of where you've seen this done really well at that's, a grassroots that's level? A like how do you take this yeah. and you know, apply it in other places? That's such a great question. I, I mean, I, I think my answer is gonna disappoint you, which is I, I really feel like it's outside my realm of experience here. Maybe, you know, maybe we can like, maybe we can like bounce some ideas off the podium. <laughs> like I, I almost feel irresponsible just to be like, oh, I think we can do this to, I don't know, I, I'm trying to think, like, what's a good entryway to thinking about that? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. Sidewalk, yeah, envelope, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the platform the platform uh, labor platform thing was what we talked about, right? Like, what uh, what would it take to instantiate a municipal platform that is not, you know, Uber Eats? Right? Yeah. Uh, I think it might have been the counterfactuals, or yeah, or untangle it, or something. Yeah. Um, but sorry, the question was, uh, how do I? Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think, um, yeah, I'm trying to be specific in my answer, I guess, why I remain optimistic about it. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm like optimist. I'm, I don't know if optim optimistic is the right word. Like, I think it's very interesting. Um, I don't, um, I, I have no illusions about a lot of this work being really hard, right? Um, because, um, because, we, I would say we still live in a pretty, I would say like political adversarial environment for like a collect, like a truly collective reimagining of what technologies can do. Like we're not in that world, right? This is still a world in which basic research gets spun out of certain university labs get picked up as startups and then go through venture capital and becomes a thing that like makes a bajillion dollars and only those things get funded, right? And only those things that have a sort of like blitz scale potential are favored with the kinds of capital it needs to grow into a, into a real technology. If we look at the thing we're doing for the city of LA, it's not fundable. It's by nature like not fundable by venture capital. No one will touch that because who wants to invest in technology development that is by definition limited to like 
2,000 users in the, in the country and no more than that. So I think it's going to be really hard, um, but I think maybe one source of optimism to your question, Laura, is I do think there is a bit of a, I do think there is a bit of a context, context shift in, in terms of like the U.S. thinking about industrial policy and thinking about like robust public investment in some of these things. So I do think that context is important. Um, you know, in addition to, to technology, I also just do planning, planning work. You know, I work, my partner, Susanna Drake, is a well-known landscape architect that does a lot of climate resilience work, and we do work together. And that work has really dramatically been accelerated in the last couple of years just because of IRA. Like, we see it. We see it every day that, like, federal funding of, you know, millions and millions of dollars for planning projects around the country so I, you know, that, that's one source of optimism, I think, is this idea, this feeling that the context is changing beneath our feet a little bit. Um, and I also just think, like, um, I, I think, um, yeah, maybe it's not optimism, it's just like a conviction that, like, the full story of some of these technologies haven't been written yet, right? Like, there is still a way in which, um, uh, you know, maybe like the, the, the full potential benefits of some of these ideas that are being developed, like they just need to be on earth somehow and that just takes creativity and hard work and I don't know, like all of the platitudes that, um, that, that, that comes with that. Sorry, I'm not, that's not a super clear answer, but um, that's my answer. Hi. I think you've largely answered my question, but I really appreciate the presentation, and I, I really um, like how honest you are about the fact that currently the sort of technocracy, and increasingly so autocracy, um, is in the hands of the private, um, predominantly, and, you know, and then you really highlight your aspirations towards certain values that yeah. the society should be heading towards this direction yeah. instead of this, but you know, at the end of the day, the private has a very clear set of goals yeah. that is against whatever that aspiration yeah. is. Um, and I guess, you know, you talked a lot about like, what could support that, like the, the fact that, you know, perhaps PTO in the, in the government that, that, you know, supports a certain thing may help, but I'm curious from your personal experience as someone who's worked in you know Google and, and or Sidewalk Labs and and other like private urban planning companies, well, like what are the sort of uh, current like temperature around these attitudes? Are people within these private firms are they pushing? Do people they care? Are, they do. Or? They really do. They really do. You know, they really do. Like I would say, um, you know, when I was at Dell within Google, we're in a partner. We're like a partner team to. Google Earth Engines, which is a, it's not a, it's not a profit making team, right? It's like completely, it's kind of like a residual artifact of an earlier Google or something where this team literally is just making a sort of environmental data catalog of all the cities in the world and working with cities to make this available and, um, help them do carbon inventories, plan for, you know, do kind of trip planning, all with the purpose of reducing carbon, right? So that, that stuff exists. Um, and I think there are other pockets of that. Um, you know, you can't separate that from the fact that it's otherwise situated in a extremely profitable firm that derives its money from cloud computing and advertising. Like, those two things are inseparable. Um, I think you also just can't overlook the contradictions of a team like that because, you know, every time there is a corporate restructuring, those teams are always, like, really at risk, right? Um, and there is also, in this particular moment, some drive towards making Google look good, greenwashing, right? So, like, obviously, those, the presence of that, those things within Google has value now that doesn't exist before, but you can't count on that as 
the permanent foundation for those kind of teams to exist in Google. So I think the situation is very complicated. Like those things do exist for sure, um, but it's it coexists with all of these other stuff, you know. Right. Yeah. So would you say like aligning those values would not be possible? That if we really do want the type of technology, well, you're talking I don't. About, I mean, I you know, it's maybe maybe what I'm trying to say here is like maybe we just all need to be operators. You know, we need to like. Yeah, like actually, oh, Google wants to greenwash, great. Then let's just leverage Google resources, do this thing and build this thing and Google might not support it forever, but that's fine, you know, like we, you know, the, my metaphor is like, you're like the satellite that's trying to like navigate the planets and try to get in various orbits and get a little boost, you know. Um, I think another major source of uh, resources I haven't talked about is foundations, right? There are a lot of major foundations that are funding um, civic technology work and, and climate resilience work, and these two things are more and more overlapping. So that's really a huge uh, set of resources that I'm very interested in looking at tapping into, but it's not uncomplicated, right? I mean, these foundations oftentimes have very ambiguous roles in many places and contexts, but um, but again, it's finding the kind of impermanent temporary alignments of interest between you and these powerful actors and find a way to like make the thing happen to the best extent you can, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, this might be a little better. A little better. Um, and I think, like, data, um, like, data is very kind of opaque, and I think, like, you know, you're one of the people that, like, work on these teams to make it approachable to, mm -hmm. you know, a venture capitalist, in a sense, or, you know, um, the head of heat, for yeah. example, yeah. In, in LA, um, and you know, you were starting to like speak about how um, you know you work to make data more accessible and less opaque, mm -hmm. you know, to people in Singapore um, with that data set. And I guess like one question is like I'm curious, like what are some successful methods that you you know use to you know create not just like an open sandbox that people can get lost in with yeah, data, which yeah. we see kind of happening a lot with yeah. um, with machine learning and all this kind of stuff of like just this, this sandbox of exploration that like we don't know what we can get out of it. And yeah. it's unclear of how people, you know, people are still figuring out how to interpret it. Like how can you, what are some successful, like successful methods that you have um, encountered in projects like that that people have understood it in a way that like they can almost yeah, like action a, on a, to influence that's a, people? That's a really good question. Uh -huh. um, you know, the, the dirty secret of like the data visualization practice field is it's pretty hermetic. Like people do beautiful, cool things and it's not really, it's not, it's not clear how efficacious effective they are in doing what it purports to do. So it's true, like I think your point is completely right. Um, trying to think like what are some really, really amazing examples of like this kind of thing being extremely useful and producing real world effects. Um, I don't know, I'm actually drawing a, drawing a blank at the moment. Um, I, you know, this is not a perfect example. Um, I've, I've always really liked just locally like the work that, um, Center for Urban Pedagogy does. Um, it's called Making Policy Public. I've always really loved it. It's not a data project. It's more 
uh, using information design to untangle complex issues for the audience that these complex urban policies questions are really affecting. So I think that's a good, that's a good example. It has a very clear purpose around public teaching, public pedagogy. Um, so I think that's a good example. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, if I were like less um, sleep deprived, I can probably tell you. But um, but I can you know I can I can we can hang around a little bit. I can you know I can I have some some other ideas. I can I can show you. Yeah. So and I, I think like another piece to that is um, when sort of collecting more data to yeah. um, you know to help make these issues. Yeah. Um, like more accessible and stuff like, uh, you know, I saw you had an example about, um, you know, creating sort of additional sensors in the environment, yeah. you know, like within the sidewalk or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think like, uh, like data is synonymous with like surveillance in mm -hmm. a sense. And yeah. um, how, like, how have you sort of, um, navigated that like public conversation of like or maybe maybe it's just like a, it's an unknown thing like you know we're we're being surveilled in, yeah no like, no number I, of ways I wouldn't, that we I wouldn't know, say like, like I wouldn't say that pavement example was like such a great example of like how to deal with this issue in the public realm right like like 70 percent of the air around sidewalk Toronto was sucked up by um questions of surveillance and privacy, which I would argue is like to the detriment of other worthwhile things to discuss around that project, but it doesn't, anyway, that's not here and there. I mean, one thing I didn't show, I worked on was a set of public uh, data, public technology transparency standards. So essentially like a bunch of like standardized information stickers that you put on things to explain to people, oh, like this, sensors collecting this data to use it for XYZ purpose. And that's also like a super limited uh, response, right? Um, because it assumes that the only thing that people can do in a situation like, like that is to consent or not consent, right? In, when in fact, there are other ways of people getting involved in, we're not involved in data collection and, and surveillance. Um, I mean, there are just so many things we can talk about here. One thing I also didn't talk about is, uh, along with the HEAT project in LA, we're also trying to develop a low-cost solution that, are, that community groups can use to do kind of crowdsource measurement of air quality and HEAT issues in their communities, so it's sort of not saying no to the idea of measurement and surveillance, but really to like give the surveilled, the historically surveilled, the ability to measure what matters in their particular environment. So that might be a different way of responding to it. Um, and that's not, again, that's not really new work that's happened a lot in various settings in here in New York, um, but what we're trying to do is to like systematize that knowledge and m make that knowledge open source and like as easy as possible to deploy and use so that any community group that gets a $3,000 grant to do this can deploy 10 sensors and measure the presence of extreme heat spots in a particular neighborhood. So that's, not, that's another example. Do we have time for one more? Um, sorry, and then the like the last uh, in that um, is uh, how do you um, how do you account for uh, sort of like not like bad actors, but I guess like uh, sort of darker like user experience um, issues like at like a governmental like municipal level with yeah. you know particularly like your like the parking project where. You know, parking is or, like or a police, big... police, uh, police. Yeah. Set, you know, yeah. Gunshot sensors uh -huh. and things like that. Like, yeah. how how do you navigate that conversation to get you know, for something like that to be beneficial at like a city level where that's a big money maker for a city and there's you know, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Do I don't that. know if it's an issue of it being a big moneymaker for the city. I think you know, a few years ago, it would have been the case that cities would just buy it because, you know, Siemens knocked on their door and was like, "You should really get this because every other city has gunshot sensors on their on their light post and it's going to do X, Y, Z." I do think a lot of cities are becoming much, 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 much more sophisticated about these things, and part of my hope is to work directly with city governments that make procurement and operational decisions around these things to um, help them set the parameters for what they actually need and what is good. I do think community engagement slash organization is a key part of this, like developing some kind of public voice around what technologies people in a given city actually want and needs and how, what the parameters are for using those. Like, that is, again, like a question of planning and community engagement. Um, so it's sort of no surprising answers here, but um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's helping cities and communities develop a point of view about what they need and don't need and what is harmful and what is not. Um, I, I guess to, sorry, to refine though, um, yeah. it was, I think the question is more about when a city benefits from ambiguity yeah. in like practices and like yeah. systems and stuff and yeah. how do you Oh, like push? when, um, yeah, I, but I, I actually, I don't know if I've actually come across many world, like real world examples of the cities benefiting from that ambiguity. Like I think we really have to talk about specifics here and like what, what kind of technologies we're talking about and what the cities are that deploys these to do what, like, like the only example I can think of is like policing technologies, that police departments cure certain sensors that disproportionately target certain communities. Um, but you might be thinking of something else, I'm not pa sure. Parking in this instance, hmm? parking in this instance. Parking, yeah, I mean, the, the cities, by parking solutions mostly out of a technocratic sense of like this is gonna help us manage parking spaces better. I don't know if there's like a lot of like necessarily a lot of bad intentions in there from day one. It can be kind of naive, but it's not to me it's not like bad intentions, if that makes sense. So yeah, I don't know. Sorry, this is not not a not a super clear answer, but maybe I can understand the questions a bit better too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again for yeah. such a fascinating presentation. I think my question is quite busy because I might not be around to you know talk after the exercise. I was just curious, where can we learn more about you, your background, and some of the work you know you do beyond your email address? Oh, you uh, okay. So um, I have a website. <laughs> my name is pretty Googleable, so. Uh, that's where Adam found my file <laughs> because I didn't send him one, uh, <laughs> and um, and the work I'll be doing. I mean, I'm I'm getting things set up on the Sasaki website right now, so that's um, you know that's coming, um, and uh, yeah, I mean you know I'm I'm in New York and you know I'm around the program. I'm, I'll probably be coming for reviews in the future. There there are more conversations to be had. Um, yeah. The intro to architecture program, so we're just here for summer. Yeah. Intro yeah. to architecture. Yeah. Oh, there is Quite one last question. Sorry. Do we, Siki? Do you have time for one more? Yeah, that's question? fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can we can talk as long as folks are okay with it. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, that was actually really interesting because just yesterday in Violet's class we had a guest lecture by Dan B. Lee, who is part of Google Dan. as well. Yeah, but no, nevertheless, I think it was super interesting how you really highlighted uh, Dan B. Lee. Oh, Dan, Dan B. Lee. No. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. Dan, Dan, because Dan she was also Google. really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she was just also very interested, like, uh, honestly critical about the new tools that Google Street Reps now allows to actually have all, like, 3D visualizations and how many data is now accessible and the responsibilities of Google as well, but I didn't want to talk about this, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just thinking, especially in terms of governance of digital and physical infrastructures, that I think it's interesting maybe now to look, I think that's also what you suggested with the LA project. It's kind of drawing 
ideas from decentralization on how governance can actually be more realizable and really also more focus on particular, I guess, groups and their needs and desires. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I think it's right. maybe also a parallel transfer from issues in Web 2 to Web 3, realizing how we have to decentralize also governance models. And yeah. I was just thinking if you, if you have maybe also other examples in mind, maybe then referring to digital ministries, for example, in Taiwan, or like there are other examples, yeah. I think, that could be applied to the ES ideally as well. Um, I try to stay away from Web3, mostly because I don't, I don't find myself all that knowledgeable about it, frankly. Um, I think, you know, um, like I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say decentralization is like, um, like for me it's not a political program or like a set of an end in itself, right? Like I, I don't, I don't think that decentralization is intrinsically better or good. Um, I think in a particular context for a particular problem, it can make a lot of sense, i.e. in the case of a community coming together to identify what the particular areas of climate vulnerabilities might be in a given geographical area for a given population, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think there is a limit to how much you can understand what's happening on the ground by using top-down analytical methods. I think that's just true. Um, so that, that is where, you know, where I agree with you in terms of the value of decentralization. Um, I look at, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm almost afraid to say too much about Web3 because I'm like, I don't know what, you know, it's so big and I'm not that knowledgeable of what, what do I even get into. Um, I think for, yeah, I mean, you know, as a, both the technologies and the technologists and the planner, planner who works on larger city scale problems of climate adaptation and looking at some of the infrastructure that's actually needed to address these issues, coastal infrastructure, for example, it's hard to imagine how decentralization plays into that because that literally is like the state deploying billions of dollars and legal powers and financial powers and technical powers to like make all those things come together and build a levy system, right? Like it's hard to imagine how decentralization plays into that. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's just a fact, right? Um, anyway, I just, I'm rambling on a little bit now, but yeah. Okay, sweet. I think that's all we have time for, but thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for the conversation and thanks for the lecture. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.